Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 168th New Social Environment. I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on the iconic Andy Warhol, who is the focus of a new and deeply comprehensive monograph, uh, which came out earlier this year by art critic Blake Gopnik, who joins us today as our special guest. Uh, he will be in conversation with rail editor at large, Amanda Glubizzi, and we're also thrilled to have the poet Sharon Mesmer here with us today, who will read to close today's program. To begin, uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail asks to honor the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Rashard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others who we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we would also like to acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I pass the mic over to Amanda and Blake uh, to start off this conversation, we invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce our illustrious speakers, Amanda Glubizzi is an art scene editor here at the Brooklyn Rail, an art historian. She is the co-director of the New Foundation for Art History, author of the forthcoming monograph, Art and Design in 1960s New York, and most recently guest edited our critics page section for the Rail's October issue, curating a selection of essays that each consider the edges of paintings as conventions, as inversions of those conventions, or as potent sites of resistance. Uh, I'll drop the link in the chat shortly because it's really quite dazzling and worth checking out. Blake Gopnik uh, began his career as an academic with a doctor. Perfect, so sorry. Blake Gopnik began his career as an academic with a doctorate from Oxford, but since 1998 has been chief art critic at the Globe and Mail in Toronto, the Washington Post and Newsweek. He has been a critic at large for Artnet News and is a regular ever contributor to the New York Times. His truly comprehensive biography on the life and ever evolving sensibility of Andy Warhol, for which he interviewed over 260 people and poured over literally 100,000 documents, if not more in the archives. Uh, and this biography is the fabulous occasion for this conversation today. It came out earlier this year with Echo at Harper Collins. We're so happy to have you join us. Uh, without further ado, Amanda, turning the mic over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for New Social Environment 168. And thank you to Blake and Malvika for, for manning this and womaning this. Um, one thing that I want to say is Blake and I are very, very appreciative to all of you for attending this new social environment. We understand that everyone is on. Um, my husband has pledged to run in um, and interrupt if something should happen. So um, we, we, may, we understand that we may be a little upended if the news, if the news breaks in, in positive or negative ways. And as Blake has mentioned already, that would be such a Warholian thing to do. Um, Blake and I have been working on this for, uh, gosh, I don't even know, a month and a half, maybe two months now already. And one of the things we realized is that we were going to speak the week of the election. And we recognized too that, you know, we had no idea what the outcome of the election was going to be and that people could be really happy or people could be really, really upset or we might just be on tender hooks, we really didn't know. And so we joked right away that we should talk about the dark Andy Warhol. And this was just kind of a joke amongst us. And then Blake said, well, actually, 
the dark Andy Warhol is my favorite Andy Warhol. And I was like, oh my God, the dark Andy Warhol is my favorite Andy Warhol. So we're going to begin by speaking about the dark Andy Warhol. The dark so, side. The dark side, that's right. So Emily, could you please begin the slideshow for us? <laughs> well, let me talk. Well, <laughs> Perfect. Go. This technical glitch. Um, I guess what I wanted to say, uh, oh, looks like it's happening. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. What I wanted to say is that the thing that amazes me about Warhol that I discovered in the course of writing my biography is that the dark Andy Warhol is Andy Warhol. There's almost never a moment when he isn't the dark Andy Warhol. So our first slide, people can just imagine for the minute because you've all seen it before, is the Campbell soup cans. And they look like the light Andy Warhol. They look, you know, chipper. That's the sort of current popular reading of them. But when they came out, they were seen as absolutely ferocious objects, as breaking every rule in art, uh, every rule of politesse when it comes to, to what, it, uh, what an artwork should show. They really were greeted with, with horror. And that has pretty much survived in the reception of Warhol. I mean, one of the things that surprised me when my book came out is that the right wing really took exception to it. They see Warhol as a kind of evil figure that represents everything that's wrong with art, that's been wrong with art since, I don't know, since Bouguereau or something like that. So this light, this theoretically lighthearted artist producing lighthearted art gets this reception as someone who's really evil. And that's true on the left as well because of the whole business art concept, the whole notion of Warhol as a sellout turns him into a, an enemy of the left as well. So to my great surprise, it turns out that all these years later, he's still controversial and still has a dark side for, to everything he does. So in fact, almost any uh, web chat we did about Warhol could count as the dark Warhol. We're gonna be talking about the explicitly dark, but there really isn't a light Warhol except in the popular imagination. And he had a part, I think, in making that happen, but it isn't really right. I think that deep down Warhol, Warhol is dark at almost every moment. So one thing else I should say is that one of the things that Blake and I agreed to is we'll talk about Warhol's life, of course, because we we should. We're, we're talking about a biography of Warhol. But what we've really chosen to do is talk about, oh, there it is. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. That is a big book. <laughs> um, but what we've chosen to do is actually talk about Warhol's art. Um, this is something that's been a little bit different from the other conversations that Blake has had um, about the book. And this is actually exciting for both of us since we are both trained as art historians. Um, I have to say that I have always felt a little uncomfortable in the presence of the Campbell's soup cans. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure if it's the, the lack of a grounding cast shadow mm -hmm. um, or if it's the seeming similarity of them and then the awareness that you are eating, if you were to eat them, something that is canned um, and that not canned by you or by your loving mom or grandma or, or your, your uncle, but something that was made by someone that you don't know and that you're going to ingest. Um, of course, you and I are probably also thinking in the back of our minds about like tuna fish disaster and things like that, right? Where there's, of course, Lysistra in, in the cans and people do die from them. But for me, there is something really, really ominous about them. Repetition, I think, and I'm sure we're going to get to this later. Repetition has something ominous about it. You're not supposed to look at 32 Campbell soup cans all at once. There's something, something a little diseased about it, a little, the word that people always use of Warhol, which is I think the wrong word, but we can use it as shorthand for now of the art. So there's something autistic about it, right? This mm -hmm. is not how things are supposed to work in art or in the world. And that's creepy. I mean, and it sets up this notion of Warhol as a creep. One of the people I interviewed who's now in his nineties, still alive, referred to Warhol as a creep from the first time he met him. And in the 1960s, creep had a really heavy weight to it that it doesn't have now. There is something creepy about the whole Warholian project, I'd say. 
Yeah, I think too, you know, I, what it, we're showing here is an installation of the 32 Campbell soup cans um, that are owned by MoMA. And we, I have seen them installed this way, but more recently MoMA installed them the way they were originally shown, which was on a shelf around a room. And for some reason there too, I think instead of being like forced to look at them all at once, rather than being forced to look at them one after the other, after the other, after the other. I mean, it's kind of Judd before Judd, but without the warm and fuzziness of Donald Judd. <laughs> That's beautiful, yeah. Um, <laughs> now, one of my arguments about, I mean, I think one of the things that makes these creepy for, uh, you know, especially people like you and me, is that once they were on that little shelf running around the room, the standard argument is that that, mean, that was supposed to simulate a supermarket display, but I don't buy that for a second. Yes. Supermarkets don't display these as precious objects on a little precious shelf with labels under each one. That sets them up as very much in the tradition of high art. That's a print room display. That's how you show a bunch of Rembrandt prints. And that is one of the things that I think makes them creepy is that there are objects that's, that so obviously break so many rules for what fine art's supposed to be. And yet they're always presented in the context of the highest of fine art. And that, for me, that's the central key to understanding Warhol is the breaking of art world rules more than any other rule. I mean, one of the things that I love discovering in my book is just how good an education he had in art history in college. Yeah. Um, he's really, I think, always, even when he seems to be, you know, at his most, as it were, popular or populist, when he's doing MTV video, I think he's always really inhabiting somewhere deep inside. He's inhabiting his role as a, as a very high avant-gardist, a classic 20th century avant-gardist. And the ways in which his art refuses to sit there comfortably, I think is one of the reasons it's always dark. Mm. I think too, um, these are fairly small scale, but some of Campbell's soup cans are quite large. And there too, it almost reminds me of, um, <sighs> like a Rothko, you know, Rothkos are all meant to be about the size of Rothko, about 5'8". Um, I'm 5'8", so whenever I encounter a Rothko, it is my size. Um, he said that he wanted them to be intimate and that's why they're so large. Whereas with Warhol, I don't think that you are necessarily invited to have intimacy with this thing or, or, or how could you possibly have intimacy with it, right? Yeah. And so there too, it's, it's your size or bigger, but it's something that's exceptionally off-putting and intrusive into your own world and into your own psyche. It's funny you mentioned Rothko because there's a story that may be apocryphal, but there is a story that from very early on, the Campbell soups were seen as mimicking the the kind of uh, spatial binary of a Rothko painting that they were deliberately, there's one reading of them that they were deliberately anti-Rothko, that they have that, that horizontal division between top and bottom that's so classically Rothko. It's a nice reading. I don't know if it's people, people dated back to the 60s and I'm not sure that that's correct, but that is yeah. certainly one of the things that's claimed for them. And it makes sense. They yeah, do. it does. I mean, and if Lichtenstein made these Campbell soup cans, then it would definitely be the case. Right. And but we just don't realize that Warhol was absolutely at every moment in his career was utterly aware of what counted as the the cutting edge re, uh, reading of what art should be. He was absolutely in competition with whatever yeah. at any given moment counted as as extreme art. Yes. Um, so, Emily, could we move to the second slide, please? I thought okay. we'd just spend the whole, the whole talk on that one slide. <laughs> we, I, well, you could. That's the amazing thing about Warhol, right? And this too, I think is actually, um, it makes us art a little nefarious, right? It seems like it's so obvious. It seems like it's so in your face. Um, it's, it's banal, it's deadpan, and yet it's not. Um, it makes you do things because of it, um, which is, you know, it has designs on you in an interesting way. So um, this is a quote from Blake's book. Um, and when I read it, I was like, oh my God, this is why I find Warhol dark. And so um, allow me to read this to you. Popular music could also function in almost Cajun terms as a subject for aesthetic analysis. What Blake is writing about here is um, when Warhol decides to become like kind of like the teeny bop Warhol, he starts playing pop songs continuously, just repeating them over and over and over again when he's working. When one guest at the townhouse wondered why they had to hear the same single so many times in a row, 
Warhol explained that the singer must have rehearsed and recorded it time after time and said, Warhol, I really want to suffer along with him and really find out what it is all about. That's closer to the thinking of a psychologist than of a fanboy. It also anticipates the kind of suffering that Warhol imposed on his viewers with the endless repetitions in his paintings and films. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like about that quote from him is that it's Warhol, I think that's the real Warhol, 99% of the quotes that, that are attributed to Warhol, especially the most famous ones, I don't think give you any insight at all into him as an artist, him as a person, they are completely manufactured parts of his persona. But here, that kind of really sort of out of left field thinking is what the real Warhol is. And I've listened to enough conversations between him and curators, you know, recordings or transcripts of conversations he had on the phone. And those kind of imaginative leaps, going from a totally absurd boy band pop song to imagining the suffering involved in making it, that's the real Warhol. He had this amazing mind that was able to make these connections that I think very few other people would have made. And that's what gets me so excited about the kind of thinking he, he did, but, and that is completely in the work. So I think there really is a case here where the, the, the person, the artist is in the work, but in this very complicated way. And suffering, it turns out that suffering is right there um, in his thought about even something as stupid as a really, I mean, he listened often not to the Beatles or the Stones that we did listen to them. He was listening to absolute junk and knew it. And I'm not convinced that when the, in fact, I am convinced that when the curators and the dealers left, he turned off that music. And there's even some evidence that he would put on Bach. So he was always, you know, closet high-end character. I, I hope he's putting on Glenn Gould doing Bach. <laughs> you know, I talk about that. 32 Goldberg variations was the, the uh, you know, culturatus uh, piece of music at just this moment that he's yes. doing the 32 Campbell Soups. I, I, I like the idea of, um, for those in our participant audience, if you've listened to Glenn Gould, you can hear him breathing, right? Um, this was something he was notorious for, that he's, he's concentrating so much and interpreting so deeply that he's actually breathing quite heavily as he's doing it. And so I actually really love the idea of Warhol listening to Bach, but really also possibly listening to Bach to listen to Glenn Gould breathe. Yeah, and that's the kind of failing that Warhol's so interested in, right? Getting it wrong, doing a bad silkscreen, letting the, the mess of silkscreening show through. You know, that in a, you know, because Glenn Gould, they complained, his, his uh, recording yes. was complained about the noise of breathing. And he basically said, so what? That's, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. Uh, so there's, I like that notion that even something as refined as Glenn Gould's Goldberg variations have uh, errors built in that Warhol would have been interested in. Yes, well, and, and also I think he was, you know, quite the, the, the intellectual dish at that point too. So there was that too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if we move to the next slide, um, Blake just mentioned the mistakes in silk screening, and I think that this is this is the perfect slide to show here. Um, these are, of course, uh, Warhol's Maryland's. This is Maryland diptych from '62, and one of the things that's really really interesting here is that. Warhol is not making perfect repetition, even when he starts using silk screens. He's he's not going for that. However, you point out, Blake, that he's completely in control of the medium. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that people get wrong, so wrong about him is the notion that he came to silk screening in a kind of naive way in the summer of 1962 or the spring of 1962. I've got tons of evidence that he would have known silk screening backwards and forwards from uh, college days yet. And he had been silk screening fabrics or rather designing fabrics to be silk screened just uh, around this time. He was a maker of, uh, you know, a, a designer of, of textiles, which was completely a silk screen process. So he knew exactly what silk screens could, could be. And his textiles are perfectly silk screened. He knew that silk screening could be done with unbelievable precision. And yet it's totally volitional that he decides that he's going to silk screen badly. Um, so one of the reasons that we show Marilyn, and we, we have a Marilyn on the next slide too, but I'm, I want to stay here for a moment, is that we could think of Marilyn as being um, something that is about the surface Warhol. Um, you know, she, she was glamorous. Um, we could understand her perhaps as almost like a, a working class heroine. Um, uh, as many writers have pointed out, as opposed to a patrician heroine. Um, 
even Jackie O or Jackie Kennedy when he when he portrayed her. Um, but there's also a lot of, of sadness and despair when we think about uh, Marilyn Monroe, especially in 1962. And so First, I'd just like to ask you to talk a little bit about um, what is going on in Marilyn Monroe's life at this moment and what you believe that you've, you've uncovered about why Warhol is painting her at this point. Well, I mean, the standard story is that he, that he tells, but of course, stories Warhol tell are more likely to be wrong than to be right, to be lies than to be truth. The standard story is that he um, started uh, silk screening her just after she died, which would have been, I think she died on August 5th. So the headlines of her death would have arrived August 6th, 1962, which is his birthday. So Warhol would have been deeply aware of Marilyn's death. And the story is that he then started silk screening this tragic figure. I think that it's more likely that he'd already been silk screening her. There's certainly an interest, he, uh, there's evidence that he had an interest in Marilyn, you know, from several years earlier. And I think it would be typically Warholian for him to claim that he silk screened her after her death when that wasn't the case. That is to, in a sense, I don't know what, how to express it exactly, to, to, to simulate mourning uh, that wasn't actually going on when he made the work, to have the, the work self-consciously occupy this space of mourning, regardless of whether that's why it was made. Now, Marilyn was already a tragic figure anyways. Everyone knew that she was, that, that her life was not going well. I mean, this was not a secret. So even before her death, that's part of the story. And of course, there's a, a, a strange uh, ironic uh, quality to, to silk screening her, especially in the left-hand image, the colored one, as perfectly chipper. And this is 1952. This is Marilyn at the very beginning of her career. Um, to silk screen is perfectly chipper when everyone knows that she's falling apart when he's making this image. That seems to me, more interesting and more subtle and more really Warholian than imagine that he does an old fashioned gesture of commemoration, of mourning, of a eulogy for her. And in fact, interesting thing about these two pictures is that they are joined now, they're always referred to as the Marilyn Diptych, but he didn't make them to go together. It was a typical, this is a typically Warholian story. He, it was one of his collectors, Emily Tremaine, who suggested they go together. So when they were first made, they were separate. In, and I think, that the one on the left could easily be um, before Marilyn's death. And then he makes the next one. And the thing about Warhol is I think he sometimes does get things wrong. And I think that the black and white image is actually a little facile watching her disappear. That seems like a not as sophisticated as Warhol is as his best, at his best. People love talking about you know, the disappearance of Marilyn as she dies into, into, this, uh, into the, the surface of the, of the, of the canvas. But I think that's actually a rather facile image. And, and the other image, of course, of her being canceled by the, the black silk screen ink and some of the, the middle images there. But for me, that's a little simple-minded. Um, so I'm less interested in that. I think um, one of the things that all of us can do, right, of course, is put our left hands over the, the color image, right? And see the right hand image, see the black and white image. And notice that I think Blake is really right about this, right? And I think then that his collector Tremaine is right about this, right? They, they belong together. I think that they, it's important in fact that they are together. Um, one of the things too that's interesting is that this image doesn't get a lot of critical attention. Um, it's, it's understood to be an image of Marilyn Monroe. People take his, his words um, and, you know, kind of talk about it as a memorial. And that's kind of it until Warhol himself dies. And then there's more critical attention that starts to get paid to what Tom Crow called his earlier work, um, meaning the work from the 60s, the early 60s, as opposed to his really early work, um, his design work and things like that. Um, one of the things that Tom Crow writes um, in an essay called Saturday Disasters is that the passage from life to death reverses itself in these Marilyn images. She is most present where her image is least permanent. Um, so here, I think that Crow could be almost reversing the idea of the, the facile nature of the right-hand panel of this diptych. Yeah, I, I've never quite been able to, to figure out just what he means by that, because she seems uh, 
uh, least present where she's least present to me. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what he means. Um, and that's what I object to on the right-hand panel is that she's yeah. too easily not present. She's too easily dead. And I think you could argue that it's the, it's the colored panel that's actually more mournful because that's, that's Marilyn. I mean, especially if you're looking at this after her death, that's remembering her at her, if not in her heyday, at the very beginning when things look promising. So that mm -hmm. seems to really the, to the truly tragic image, that repetition of Marilyn, the 1952 Marilyn from the movie Niagara again and again. And you could argue that what, ha what that does to her, of course, is eventually erase her as in the yeah. right hand panel, that that's the cruel Marilyn is the one that's repeated and repeated. And she said something like that. Mm -hmm. She recognize herself in that, in that Marilyn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the I other think thing that, that yeah, interests me about this image is that the, you know, I've always wondered why did he use an image from Niagara, right? This is a movie that's not very well known. It's one of her first movies. And then it turns out that that particular um, image is discussed in a work of French film theory that Warhol owned that was on Warhol's shelf. And it would be totally typical of Warhol to take something from high culture, from intellectual culture, and secretly present it as the work of this naive poppy kind of figure, where of course he's not really part of pop culture, he's really part of high culture. He wants to be part of high culture. But throughout his life, he realizes that by far the most interesting avant-garde gesture he can do, classically avant-garde gesture, is to plunge into popular culture in this pseudo naive kind of way. And I just love the fact that this thing actually comes from a work of high theory. That, that's, of course, really amazing. I always assumed it was because her jaw and her teeth are so set. You know, she looks exceptionally sexy. Of course, she's beautiful. She's Marilyn Monroe. But also, she is tense from, let's say, the upper lip down, right? Um, something that I think her, her uh, eyebrows for, you know, give us another idea. And so for me, it was always a, a question of, you know, was he looking at the set of that mouth and, and really, really thinking about that? And of course, then that gets, gets repeated again and again and again. And it's important that you mention the work of French film theory, because that, that is the crux of Crow's argument about Marilyn, is that she seems to be most herself when she's on the flickering image of the screen, the, the film screen, particularly in films like Some Like It Hot. And so when we see her flickering here back and forth, um, being present, obscured, disappeared, that's where for him at least, it seems like she's the most um, herself. She's certainly the self that we know through, uh, through mass media, right? Yes. That's, the, yes. that's the Marilyn that people are really encountering. Absolutely. Just a tiny little anecdote because I can't resist it. Yeah, please. I have known that particular Marilyn for literally as long as I can remember. And I've sat in front of it for vast amounts of time because it was in the bathroom in my parents' house when I was growing up. <laughs> so I've spent long hours contemplating that or long minutes at least. Um, and I always wondered from the very youngest age, it was just a poster by the way, we did not have a Marilyn canvas in our bathroom. <laughs> I, I like thinking about that though. I wish we had. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that funny piece of green at her neck always puzzled me, that random piece of color, and I could never figure it out. And it was only in researching for my book that I realized that it's actually a strange bit of her collar. And because mm -hmm. of the way the Warhol cropped the, the image that he was given originally, the original source image, it becomes very hard to read it and it becomes a little tiny piece of abstraction. Mm. Which, and that kind of interest in abstraction and in the illegible I think mm. it's very typically Warholian. And I think that for almost everyone, that bit of color, which he plays with in all of the images, yeah. uh, stands out as something strange. You know, maybe it's I a maybe it's a Bar <laughs> Barthesian punctum. It could be the punctum. It could almost be like an Ellsworth Kellyan sort of geographical um, outline too, you know? I mean, it's kind of a fascinating thing. If we move to the next image, we can see it again. There we go. Well, there it is. Yeah, that's um, right. So this is gold Maryland. So Maryland is, is existing here on a, on a gold ground, a gold painted ground. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, you mentioned it in your book, but you've also mentioned it in other conversations that you've had about Warhol, is that everything for Warhol was an art material. Um, and I think one of the things that you've said that is most damning for the dark Warhol is that people were also art materials. 
for Warhol. Um, the, and this is something then that we can start to think about throughout the rest of his career um, and something hopefully we'll get to in a little bit when we talk about, for example, ladies and gentlemen um, and the, the possible way of thinking about exploiting people here. But I was wondering if you would like to talk a little bit about people as art materials or everything as art materials. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the central arguments of my book, in a sense, is that it's a mistake to see Warhol essentially as a painter who dabbles in other things. And I, I see his interest in, you know, the classic phrases, alighting the gap between art and life. I see that as very much part of what was the, the cutting edge of avant-gardism in the 1960s. So I see him as absolutely part of, you know, the world that gave birth to Chris Burden not that much later. I see him as very much a self-consciously performative artist, a performative figure, in the films especially, of course, that becomes mm -hmm. clearer and clearer. Um, so for me, that notion that, that everything around you becomes an art supply, that's Warhol's and he does amazing things with it, but it's very much part of the discourse in the 1960s and the later 60s. I mean, amazingly, he collects Joseph Kossuth's work. He collects Chris Burden's work. People don't realize that he was a collector. Uh, he's a, he has a, a Richard Serra prop as well, early on. So he's collecting this work by these, this really difficult non-object based work uh, for the most part. So, th and that's, I think the intellectual milieu that he's really working in secretly. Um, and that's why I think the, the notion of him using his, his so-called followers, the people who visited the, um, the factory as art supplies fits with a larger uh, notion of what interesting, important art should be. And there's certainly a movement in the sixties to do away with the art object more than there is now by far. Mm -hmm. And I think Warhol was very interested in that and that you could see that playing out across the course of his, of his career. Um, so that's my, that, that's kind of my take on that. You know, I'm a biographer. Um, I tend to hesitate to go sort of the Victorian route and try to assign praise and blame as sort of the, fu the fundamental function of biography. I'm, you know, I was trained as a historian first. So I tend not to worry too much about whether any, whether in general Warhol was a good person or a bad person. I'm more interested in whether he was a good artist or a bad artist. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's an art historian's pose, right? that, well, I mean, in Warhol, of course, it's strange because if the art is the life, then then the bad is, can, can the bad life be the good art? And I'm afraid that may be the case in some cases with Warhol. Um, and with, it, with other artists too, right? I mean, this, this, is the, the, this is the burden we take on as, as art historians, right? We, we must write about Caravaggio while knowing that he killed people. Um, well, as a biographer, it's way worse. If you're an art historian slash biographer, then you're really stuck. You know, you really have a problem on your hands. <laughs> That's right. Let's move to the the next image, and then we'll move a little faster. Um, so, of course, that, I'm going to play a little trick on you. Oh, okay. I'm going to. I want to just read two quotes because I think it's totally Please. relevant here, and I just put them yeah. in the uh, put them in the chat um, uh, because. They, they show that our reading of Warhol, the dark Warhol, even though it goes against a lot of the popular and even professional notions of Warhol, were absolutely in play in the 1960s. Uh, so, well, in, or at least in the 1970s. Um, so, did I put the right quotes in here? I'm sorry, I might've put the wrong. Oh no, I, let me just ignore the bottom quote, which is about camp and is irrelevant to what I want to talk about now because I pasted it wrong. Um, but I'm gonna quote, uh, Gregory Batcock in Other Scenes Magazine from November 1970. Like so many really good artists, Warhol is a fraud. He is not what he pretends to be. Warhol is not supremely aloof and indifferent, but rather deeply committed and surprisingly sophisticated concerning the repressive society. Warhol is not socially uninterested and politically ambivalent, but has some understanding as well as sympathy for the causes of protest and revolt in American society. That's Warhol's friend, Gregory Batcock, one of the most perceptive critics of the 1960s, seeing a dark political side to Warhol already at that time. And Warhol, in his first ever statement uh, as an artist, the first time his pop art is ever shown, uh, it's in a new talent feature for Art in America in the spring of 1962. And he says about his own art, he says, it's a statement of the symbols of the harsh, impersonal products and brash materialist objects on which America is built today. It is a projection of everything that can be bought and sold, the practical but impermanent symbols that sustain us. 
So there in his very, very first statement, we see Warhol having essentially a political take on his own work. And I think it's important to remember that this isn't, uh, well, uh, what Hal Foster would call a projection onto the work. That this right. is very credible if, if as art historians, we care about period readings, a dark reading, a political reading of Warhol was absolutely credible and was credible for someone who knew Warhol extremely well, like Gregory Batcock did. So this isn't just a, a, a wacky notion that we're, where we're trying to save the phenomena. This is in the heart of Warhol, Warhol's reception in his own day. Yes, I completely agree. And I think when we, when we look at a lot of his statements too, I, like the one that we have on the screen right now, um, the more you look at the same thing, the more meaning goes away and the better and emptier you feel. The idea that you would feel better when empty, I think is, is something that is absolutely devastating. Yeah, I mean, the problem with that quote, and I'll just go back to this because it yeah. can never be said enough times, is that popism is entirely ghostwritten. Of course. There's no reason to believe that that ever left Warhol's mouth. That could be often it's someone else says it about him and they put it into his voice, or he could have said it. It's not entirely ghostwritten. So it's very, very hard to attribute intention to Warhol. And it amazes me. I mean, Warhol's a kind of lesson in the failings of intentional readings. And yet people, including yours truly, are always using quotes from him as though they, and from every artist. I mean, art historians are always using quotes from artists to get at their original, their original meanings. Yes. And with Warhol, it's so clearly impossible to do. It's so clearly wrong-headed, and yet we do it. I do it all the time. Of course, we cherry pick the quotes that support our arguments of course, of and course. ignore the other ones. But <laughs> Warhol really is a lesson, and I think a deliberate lesson, in the problem of intentionality. And in the 50s and 60s, intentionality was deeply in question, right? It was yes. the, the intentional fallacy was born as a fallacy in this, basically in this generation of critics. So that's really central to, to the whole we're holding in discourse around this time. And it, that's one of the things that interests me most about it. Um, let's move to slide seven. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> um, so one more, oh. there we go. Um, so this is for me, at least the most disturbing Warhol. Um, and here is how Foster kind of taking issue with this idea that if you look at the same thing over and over again, the more indifferent you are to it and the better you feel about it. Foster writes in this essay, Death in America, this indifference to the victim impaled on the telephone pole is bad enough, but its repetition is galling. And so what we're seeing here is White Disaster 2. Um, this is one of the horrific car crashes that Warhol depicted in the early 60s. There is a person impaled on a telephone pole in the left-hand part of the image. And what Foster points out is that in the distance, there's a guy walking down the sidewalk completely not paying attention, um, not to the person hanging <laughs> from a pole, but also not to this burning car <laughs> in front of him. He doesn't care. And so for, for Foster, this is where he's actually going to start to take a little bit of issue with Warhol. He, he then makes an argument that actually what, what Warhol is doing is kind of dealing with trauma, um, that he can't see the trauma or experience the trauma, and so he's then reproducing the trauma. Um, but for, for Foster too, this is the punctum. It's, it's the person in the distance completely blithely unaware of the, the disaster in front of him. Although I'm not convinced that Hall Foster is making this argument against Warhol. That is, the gallingness is part of the excellence, I think, in this picture. Or that's what he comes around to eventually, I think, in his argument. That the, the simple-minded reading is that, oh, isn't this, you know, an amazing view of the darkness of life. That it's a straightforward kind of social critical view. And what he's saying is, no, it's much more complicated than that. It's the indifference is also there, which is, it, really, it's not that different a reading because the indifference is yet another feature of the world that one can draw attention to. Mm -hmm. I mean, this painting makes me think of W.H. Auden's um, Musée des Beaux-Arts, mm. right? where, where um, mm -hmm. you, you know, the port is going about its normal everyday business as Icarus falls from the sky. Yes, um, yes. And you can see the two little legs floating, well, floating, sinking. And, and I think it's perfectly water. incredible that Warhol knew that. Reference. Oh, absolutely, it absolutely. It surprise me at all. Um, 
The other thing that interests me about this is it's unfinishedness, the fact that the, there's sort of, it's begging you to have another image there. And mm. I think if it had completed, if there'd been six images, it would have felt less serial in a sense than by only having five, because it invokes a notion that this could con con continue ad infinitum, that we've paused a repetition here, that it's not finished, and the rep repetition could continue for as long as we wanted. And of course, that's very filmic, right? It's the, it's the you know, five frames from out of the 32 that there are in a second, or 26, I guess. I think too, it's also compositional, right? I mean, were there six, it would be totally inert as a composition. Whereas with five, it's still active. It has a diagonal, um, you know, it, even though the image is four square, it, it, it does something, it is active as an image. Though it seems flawed even as an image. That is, I don't think you'd find many compositions quite like this in the history of art. Uh, it does seem strange. Uh, powerful, I agree, but it doesn't look like any other picture that had come before it. Whereas when you know, the, the Marilyn, the repeated Marilyns are very much in a tradition of seriality that, you know, several women artists especially have been exploring in the previous five years. And I think we're all deeply indebted to them. But the breaking of the repetition, the resistance of a kind of textile mode, if you like, that I think is particularly interesting and, and naughty in mm -hmm. formalist terms. Um, let's move to the the next image. But um, Blake, could you please name the women artists that you were you were just referencing there, just for our audience? Absolutely, uh, Chrissa C H R Y S S A. Absolutely neglected now as an artist, barely even um, noticed as an artist. It was extremely hot in 1991. She had a solo show with the Guggenheim of images that look remarkably like Warhol's. There there are sampled bits of newspaper just presented on the canvas in a rep repetitive. Um, repetitive uh, secret, sequence, serial, serially. Um, very, very Warholian. And everyone was talking about her. She was really, really important. And Ruth Asawa in the late 50s, while she was at Black Mountain College, was doing uh, repeated uh, imagery using a stamp, actually, which Warhol also used, uh, uh, a rubber stamp. Um, so I, I think the relationship of Warhol to women artists and women predecessors, excuse me, is extremely important. Um, to me and, and very, an important to understanding world gender uh, identity, which I think is very flexible and very interesting. Um, this is one of the great things about Blake's book. Um, he really delves into Warhol's relationships with women, um, which of course are complex, right? Because he was a human being, um, he was not a machine. And so, you know, there, there are happinesses and sadnesses and jealousies and things like that. But Warhol had, intense and productive friendships with women throughout his life that he he clearly acknowledged in a way that not every male artist would necessarily have done. I mean, he on several occasions declared women artists obviously the greatest artists of the European tradition or of any tradition, in fact, because he thinks he thought Navajo weavers were mostly women and held them up as examples of really great uh, artists of any kind and women artists in particular. So no, it was interesting. His relationship to women is really complex and it shows in Marilyn as well. Is he sympathetic to her? Or is he not sympathetic? Is he in a sense making fun of her? Yeah. Um, so just briefly, this is one of the race riot paintings that Warhol made. Um, and, you know, this I think goes to Blake's point that you know, Warhol in the 60s um, and in 1970, when Badcock is writing about him, um, is someone who is engaged with the politics of his time. Um, he becomes a more, um, an even more complex political figure as he gets older, let's put it that way. Um, but here too, we can't look at these images and claim that he's just reproducing them just as an image or something that is just completely a blank. Obviously, I think he's reproducing them for a purpose, um, even if it's just a purpose for himself. Um, Tom Crow, again, in Saturday Disasters, uses these and other images to argue that Warhol actually developed a history painting, um, this monumental painting that, that depicts the, the moment of its time and does something that's meant to, to cause us to, to pause. Yeah, I mean, again, we fall into the intentional trap of referring of to Warhol, but whenever possible, I like to refer in general in art criticism, art history, to the art, the art as having the intention. Yes. Um, and there is no way that anyone in 1964 would not have read these pictures as deeply engaged in the world. Yes. I mean, anyone today to see a bunch, I mean, Race Ride is not Warhol's 
title. Let's be very clear. Warhol had no title, yeah. of course, originally for this. He never titled things, or almost never. Um, this is not a race riot. This is a bunch of white cops sicking dogs on peaceful yeah. protesters. Um, there's no way anyone, as the 60s picked up speed and you know the, the politics of the 60s got more and more engaged, no one could have read this as anything other than engaged in those politics. And it's worth pointing out that these were not shown in the United States originally. They first were shown in France, where Warhol was and is always seen as uh, a deeply political figure. In fact, the European reading of Warhol was always as a social critic. So it's sort of funny to see that being recuperated by an art historian like Tom Crow when it was always present in Germany and, and um, Italy and, um, and France. And that was the original reading of Warhol in France. When you read the, the period criticism of Warhol, period reviews of Warhol, they praise him to the skies for his even anti-American uh, attitudes. I mean, this show, the show he wanted to send to France, he wanted it to be called Death in America. That shows you the extent to which, and that he said quite explicitly. So it's clear that, I mean, that, there's no way that's not a political statement to call the show Death in America. <laughs> um, for the next image, uh, Blake and I particularly wanted to talk about the dark Warhol with his pop work, um, because that's something, you know, that can be easily elided. But one thing that I want to bring up here, if, if those of you who are in the audience have not yet read Blake's book, is that it starts with what you call Warhol's first death. And um, that, uh, you know, a lot of people who would talk about the dark Warhol might actually start with this, this moment when Warhol is shot and then has to undergo massive operations and then a huge hospital recovery. Um, here is uh, Richard Avedon's photograph of Andy Warhol. Um, this is the year after Warhol is shot, Warhol shot in 68. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, it's an intense, intense image, right? Um, not least because we're not seeing the identifying characteristics of Warhol, um, you know, no wig, no sunglasses, things like that. It rather, we're, we're presented with a torso, but not a classical Greek torso or a Michelangelo, but rather this, this scarred, scarred torso. And yet it's being shot and Warhol knows absolutely it's being shot by the great stylist, the great yeah. fashion photographer, who by the way, Warhol was in head to head competition with at every moment in his commercial career from the fifties on. The two of them were really neck and neck. And as far as I could tell, basically disliked each other intensely. <laughs> of course, by this point, Warhol has totally won the battle. I mean, Dick Avedon is trying to get recognition for as a fine artist, but having very little success. And Warhol has lapped him several times yeah. at this point. And yet Warhol is willing to self-present as a figure grist for the mill of this great fashion stylist. And yet what he presents is not the tidy Warhol of the factory, but rather this, this half dismembered corpse. So there's a really nice balancing of a desire to be part of the world of high fashion and a willing to present himself as something much darker than that at the same time. Um, one question that I had for you about this, um, you comment in your book, uh, for quite a long time, Warhol had a tendency to ask people if he could draw their feet or um, if he was feeling, I guess, bold to, to draw their genitalia. Um, and many, many people complied. Um, do you think that this is kind of his response to that? Hmm, I have not thought about that. Um, uh, explain to me why you, uh, why you asked that. I'm not quite getting it. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering. Um, his, his revealing himself nude. Right, you know? yeah, just revealing himself, you know, um, if he was asked, he would do it. And, you know, right. something, you know, that like in his own artistic practice, he asked and people revealed. And so perhaps then this is a way for him to kind of participate in that. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the funny things about this image is that Warhol actually looks, I mean, other than the giant scars all over his body, he looks a little bit buff. And he actually was buff. That's one of the strange things. Our notion of Warhol as this, this skinny, a feet, um, a Twinkie is just not correct. He went to the gym before anyone else was going to the gym in the 50s. I've actually looked at the, his gym membership receipts and the little thing that tells, shows each visit he went to the gym in the 1950s. He was working out and there's one photograph of him half naked where he looks really buff. 
And his lover, John Giorno, also says that Warhol actually had a great body, a beautiful body. So I think in this image, it's kind of interesting that, as you say, it hovers over, I mean, the, the Apollo Belvedere is not far away. I know. And <laughs> that hand that he has over his torso, what he's actually doing with that is he's pushing in a huge hernia he had, a hernia that was the size of a football that stuck out from his body. So he's actually making himself look more normal by having his hand there, but it doesn't look like that. It looks like he could be ready to put it down his own pants or something like that. It looks like a sexy gesture. Yeah. What he's doing is, is making sure that in fact, the full scale of his debility is not revealed. Yes. Um, I just want to point out that when Blake um, was interviewed by the spectator in the UK, they said that it, the hernia was the size of a rugby ball. Just I like that. <laughs> Warhol would have loved that. He loved those funny little, you know, is that naparia? But he loved those kind of strangenesses. He mm -hmm. would dwell on something like that for a long time because he had such an interesting mind. That's exactly the kind of thing that would have struck him as interesting and worth 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 chewing over. Um, so Blake, do you want to continue with Dark Warhol or should we move on to our next topic? Um, we don't have much time, but I think we should we should take a look at the next sub subject because we're we're there in a sense with that image. It's true. It's very true. Um, so uh, could we move to image fourteen, and we'll we'll move from there. Yeah. Um, this yeah. One more. Oh, maybe two more. <laughs> maybe three more. There we go. Oh, no, okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, um, so, you know, Blake and I also wanted to talk about Warhol's sexuality. Um, this is something, too, that was really ignored in the Warhol scholarship for a very, very long time. Um, no, no longer. Now it's no, no, long, no, no longer. No, now, now it's very central to the scholarship. But um, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I remember um, the first time that I ever really became aware of Andy Warhol was reading his obituary in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And um, I, I did something very Warholian and I cut it out of the newspaper. I have no idea why. I, I, I don't know that I'd ever even consciously seen an Andy Warhol, but it just seemed like something that was important um, to my future art historical self. Um, but I don't remember it mentioning, you know, his survivors in terms of his, his friendship relationships. I'm sure it didn't say gay artist Andy Warhol. No, absolutely not. And that's late, it's 87 already. It's February of 87. And yet I don't think the, the mainstream press at any, at any rate, and even the semi-mainstream press actually said, you know, Warhol important figure in gay culture. I, I, I've read a lot of the obituaries, not all of them, but I bet that very few of them mentioned that. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, to reproduce these. Um, just because uh, it's showing you how early Warhol is, is interested in being out. Um, and this is something too that Blake's book is so rich about. Um, you really delve into Warhol's awareness of, of his sexuality. And um, one of the things that we talked about was you, you made a comment about talk about dark, talk about being homosexual in 1940s and 50s Pittsburgh. Um, do you wanna just say something really briefly about that? Well, it was one of my favorite aspects of doing the research. Um, the, there's so much that still hasn't been dug up about just what it is to be gay. I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of, history, of research on, on gay history these days, but to understand the full difficulty of being gay in Pittsburgh in the 1940s and 50s is, was just incredible to me. But what matters to me is not just that, because we all know about gay bashing. We all know, at least in theory, how hard it was to be gay, has been sometimes, often still is today. But what amazes me is that Warhol, despite that, was willing to proclaim, really proclaim his, his sexuality. Not, he wasn't absolutely out, but it was he, he inhabited all of the stereotypes, if you like. He inherited, inherited the persona of a gay person from really his teen years. I mean, I actually found a tiny little slip of paper with the two sentences of uh, remembrance by one of the high school bullies who said that he beat Warhol up or he, they, they made fun of Warhol for being a fairy. So already in high school, Warhol's willing to, to be out to that extent and he never wasn't thereafter. He was always marked gay and, and happy to, be, to make himself marked as gay. Um, one of the wonderful details that Blake 
brings up is that Warhol wore nail polish um, as quite a young man. White nail polish. There's a beautiful drawing, a paint, uh, painting drawing, painting of him, a self-portrait with white nail polish on. Um, and other people uh, have talked about it as well. He wore a pink suit in Pittsburgh in 1949. That was not a safe thing to do in Pittsburgh in 1949. Um, go, let's go to your next, the next image. We're almost, I guess, yeah. out of time. We should take questions very soon. But this image matters to me a great deal because the standard thing to say is that when Warhol discovers pop, part of the reason is that the images that we were just looking at of penises of sexy gay men were unshowable in the 1950s. He tried to have a bunch of exhibitions of that work. Three times he tried to get them into the Tanager Gallery and three times they were rejected. He did manage to show them in galleries that specialized or that catered to a gay community. But of course that was a ghetto he didn't want to be stuck in. So the standard line is that he moves into pop art in order to not, in a sense, be marked as gay. But then there was also clearly a sense that I discovered in doing my research that pop art itself was seen as part of the gay community, as that the fact that it was camp and it was seen as centrally camp, and in fact, a while ago I put a little quote in the into the chat about that, was absolutely evident to anyone who was in the gay community. So there's this drawing of these sexy male feet, such as he'd been drawing throughout the 50s, perched on a Campbell soup can, which is turned so only the, the letters C-A-M-P are visible. It seems to me a kind of secret statement of Warhol's that if you think you've you've done away with the gay Warhol, you're wrong that these pictures, the Campbell soup cans, are still part of that culture that, that matters to me. Yeah, I, I really loved that reading. And I was happy to be able to find even this very tiny image. It's, it's I can't believe you it. did, because that is not easy to find, let me tell you. <laughs> um, could we move um, to two more slides down, Malvika? Yes, perfect. Um, and I just want to point this out. This is, um, this, these discussions come from an article that was published relatively recently, I think in 2018, so just a few years ago, by an art historian um, whose name I, I don't know how to pronounce, Jennifer Sichel, um, who rediscovered quite possibly one of the most famous interviews with Andy Warhol. She actually discovered the tapes of it. Under a bed in Venice. Yeah. To, to toot my own horn for a minute, I was invited to go to Venice to see them years ago. And I just thought, I'm not going to go all the way to Venice to maybe listen to some tapes that may exist. And Jennifer, uh, in, her, in her praise, actually did the work and went and found them and they were there and she listened to them and transcribed them for the rest of us and published them. So um, this is a really, really famous interview. It's um, was published in Art News. It was called What is Pop Art? And it was interviews with a bunch of different artists. Um, Warhol was featured in part one. And as you can see on the right-hand side, these are quotes that we think we know from Warhol. I think everybody should be a machine. I think everybody should think like everybody. Um, you know, I, I think that you should do the same thing every time you do it over and over again. And this is how the conversation ran in Absolutely. Art News in 1963. And this is how art historians then quoted it for 40 years. On the left-hand side, this is the actual conversation. And what all of you can see is that they're talking about being gay. Um, they're, they're actually having a very, very frank conversation about um, what it's like to, to be a homosexual in New York in the early 1960s. And the very first question that Jean Swenson, who was a writer and also a curator, poses to Warhol is, do you think pop art's queer? This is also censored from the interview. And so here too is, is evidence um, of you know, the Warhol that we make for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it's beautiful. It's the whole, I mean, the entire interview is in fact about queer, the mm -hmm. queerness of pop art. It's not just that we've chosen, a, uh, you know, one little passage. And Gene Swenson, by the way, was quite radical sexually, mm -hmm. was really into s and M. So it's it's, you know, he was in a more queer than Warhol and that gets completely elided in the printed version. Um, but the thing is that interests me is that's true of almost every interview. We have other interviews, yeah. famous interviews, you know, um, I'm, I'm not good at quoting verbatim, but the one about, you know, uh, 
uh, just look at the surface of, of my art and me, there's nothing underneath or whatever that is. I'm, right. I'm always bad at, at quoting. That also is completely fabricated. Everything you think you know Warhol said is likely to be a complete fabrication that doesn't even resemble what he actually said, let alone reflecting anything he actually thought. Um, and the thing I like about the, the real interviews, you can see how complicated it is. Warhol's thinking here isn't straightforward at all. It's got these beautiful jumps of logic, right? From liking things, from liking the same things, repetition, machines, gays being like machines because they repeat, or everyone being like machines because they repeat the same sex acts. I mean, it's really some interesting poetic, if you like, thinking, it seems to me. It's true. And I think... Um... Douglas Crimp uh, it was an art historian who wrote uh, quite a bit about Warhol and wrote about Warhol's sexuality um, and pointed out that we should be looking at Warhol's sexuality. We should be aware of it when we're looking at his art. Um, wrote something where he quoted Leo Bersani, the, the philosopher and theorist as saying that he was really interested in Warhol in the homoness of his homosexuality, that this repetition of the male um, winds up being exceptionally, exceptionally important when we start to think about Warhol and, and how we can start to understand the work that he makes. Um, I think that that then of course leaves out Liz and Marilyn and Jackie um, and all of Warhol's female friendships. But I think there is something yeah, that's very- art that isn't about the homoness of homosexuality. Right, you know. exactly, exactly. But I think that if Crimp had known about this, this transcript, he would have been nuts for it because I think it would have kind of fed right into his understanding of Warhol. Now, the thing about Crimp is what's sort of shocking is that he's writing about how we have to acknowledge Warhol's homosexuality in the late 90s. Yes. I mean, that he, yes. And he's making a ferocious argument against other art historians who don't want it taken into account. And it's just yeah. impossible to imagine that now. Yeah. It's impossible to imagine any serious art historian not, uh, you know, not engaging with the issues of Warhol's homosexuality. The other funny thing is if, again, if you go back, I think to what I put into the chat, is that early on, Warhol's art was already being seen as gay, even in the 60s. That is because it was camp and camp was, at, you know, in, according to Susan Sontag, and the New York Times, for that matter, Camp was gay. Warhol was automatically seen as gay art, as faggot art, in fact, right? The valence was completely negative, but that weirdly gets lost as he becomes incorporated into art history. There's a 20 years or so where that gets lost, where he just becomes a great artist, like any other great artist. So it's very strange the way his, the, the reality of what Warhol is comes in and out of focus. Um, if we just flip really quickly through the next couple of images, you can really see this. Um, so here's Sontag notes on camp. Yeah. Camp, dandyism in the age of mass culture makes no distinction between the unique object and the mass produced object. Camp taste transcends the nausea of the replica. Okay, so this is of course exactly what Blake is talking about. And then if we move to the, just really quickly, the next couple of images, um, this was produced for the World's Fair that was held in New York in 1964. It's the 13 most wanted men, um, mostly known as the most wanted. The only thing I'd say about that is that I think for Warhol, that title and the work itself, you know, this is, these are literally most wanted men from a recently produced brochure. Um, I think the joke was absolutely legible to Warhol and his friends. I don't, I think that the, general public was so naive sexually as it were about, and so unwilling to even entertain the possibility of homosexuality that I don't think they got the joke. After all, the title wasn't attached to the work at that time. Right, right. So no one would have said, oh, that's the 13 most wanted men, isn't that funny, right? It, the early criticism is all that, it's showing criminals when art shouldn't be showing criminals, it should be celebrating the glories. It's on the outside of the New York State Pavilion at the World's Fair. And the big objection was that it showed criminals as kind of the, the state product of New York, you know? And that was the objection, not, the, not to this undercurrent, which is absolutely there of, of, gay, of gay content. Um, Warhol is asked to change the images. And so what winds up happening is the, the image on the right, um, he paints them over in silver paint. But if we move to the next image, what he proposed was to replace all of the criminals with images of Robert Moses, who was, he held many, many um, official positions at the time. Moses was, of course, not pleased about this. 
But if we move to the next image, um, you know, here's film cells from 13 Most Beautiful Boys. Okay, so if, if we're aware of Warhol in our time and look back, then it's almost impossible for us to, to ignore knowing what we know about Warhol. And what people knew at the time. I mean, anyone who saw 13 Most Beautiful Boys, no one, especially in his world, was dumb enough to think that it was, that it didn't have homoerotic connotations. Um, and also often the more, the, the more explicitly gay material wasn't shown to the general public at all, in general. Well, sleep was. His footage of his beautiful lover, John Giorno, naked sleeping, was shown to the general public. And as far as I could tell, most of them just thought it was an image of someone sleeping. No one thought about the guy behind the camera watching the sleep going on. That's how <laughs> yeah. naive the public was, I think. I, and I think still is, right? I mean, one of the one of the interviews that Blake did, the interview, it was like, I just can't imagine watching that film. Um, you know, which is, I think, still something that that art historians and artists and art people grapple with with Warhol is, um, you know, how do we how do we present this work then to people who are kind of outside of our world, outside of our culture? Where and to get this will bring us back to darkness, and then maybe we can take questions. Yeah, he is a problematic figure still. His art has edges; people resent it. I mean, so does the you know, so does a lot of the current you know, the bien pensant art world. I get a lot of pushback from really good friends of mine, really smart critics who think the sold out Warhol is the real Warhol, that Warhol, uh, Warhol was never a serious artist, that he was just uh, interested in making money and being part of high society. That's not entirely wrong, but I think it's mostly wrong. But it's interesting that that negative valence is still attached to him. That's true. And I, he's very, very much involved in, um, avant-garde film um, in this moment, um, as you write in your book about, um, you know, filming the making of very, very important movies such as? Well, Empire, obviously, his eight, his almost eight hour footage of the Empire State Building, which I have sat through. There are, you know, several of us who've sat through the whole thing and it's glorious to sit through. I just saw that Claire Henry, one of the great experts on where all films is in the chat. And she just said, everyone should watch sleep. And she's absolutely right. It is absolutely worth sitting in front of. I once sat in front of, uh, or stood in front of Las Meninas, the great Velasquez in the Prado for a week. And that was rewarding. And I promise that sitting in front of a Warhol movie is just as rewarding, really pays off. There's a moment um, in Empire when the lights come on, um, because of course it's dark enough now that the lights come on and it's like a revelation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's a beautiful beautiful moment in Breathless too, where um, she's walking down the street and all of a sudden all the lights come on behind her as she's selling newspapers and oh I think about those things a lot. Well, don't forget that I think Breathless was very important to to Warhol, right? He adopts uh, the sh the the shirt that someone help me here the the lead female in Breathless. Um, who's the oh actor? my god. <laughs> Help us, Gene Seberg. Gene Thank you, Claire. Claire Henry just put into the chat. <laughs> the Gene Seberg wears, and his haircut isn't that far from her. I mean, I think he's really interested in that movie. He talks about it, in fact. I've got telephone conversations where he's talking about that movie. Um, but let's open up to questions, shall we? Okay, so can, I, can I do a lightning round for you really quickly, and then we'll do it, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, favorite Warhol? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. What's your favorite Warhol? I didn't think he was going to do it, Malvika. He did it. Uh, least favorite Warhol. Uh, that's hard because the worst Warhols can also be saved as being the best Warhols. That's really tricky. That is the most sold out Warhol could possibly, and I think actively, be thematizing the fact of being sold out. So it's really, it's the ones that hover halfway, like the skulls, I think are weak. We showed it for a second a minute mm -hmm. ago because they're, they're too serious to be ironic, but they're kind of uh, thin. They're too much within the history of, of Western art. They sit too comfortably within what art is supposed to be, you know, mm -hmm. the memento mori. That's mm -hmm. where I think he's weakest, when he's just yet another pretty talented artist. That's, that's where I get off the bus. And then um, what was the, your favorite thing that you discovered about Warhol when you were doing this book? Uh, you know, his- Or the most amazing. It was the quality of his education. The fact that he and his friends 
we're making experimental movies in college. And there's this great, I, I found the minutes to the department meeting. And I guess I'm enough of an academic to care about such things. And the professors are saying, what are we gonna do? The students are all fascinated by film and none of us know anything about movies. How are we gonna teach them? And I think that conversation could happen in art history departments to this day, exactly that same conversation. I, I think it probably does. <laughs> so um, his education was superb and fascinating. Pittsburgh, for just for those few years he was there, gave him an amazing exposure to the, the classic modernist avant-garde. And I think that's what fueled the rest of his career. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Blake. Let's turn it over to questions and see what our, our participants are interested in. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Blake, for this ferocious uh, primer and uh, deep dive all at once. This has been fabulous. Um, so our first question is kind of a compilation question, but it came early in the conversation in the chat from Sue Spade. Uh, and it's just to open it up. Sue Spade uh, was curious about the notion of the dark Andy Warhol to which everyone is referring. Uh, I also am not familiar with this. Um, we got a couple of comments in the chat. Nick said that the notion of the dark Andy Warhol is so well known, it even has a name, Drella. Uh, so hoping uh, to answer this question. Boy, I thought Amanda and I had coined the, the dark Andy Warhol. <laughs> we even copyrighted it actually. So don't <laughs> like using it now. Um, you know, as I said, I think it's just there throughout. That is the fact that, that what looks light and fluffy is actually troubling and troubled at the same time. And that's true of his life as well. He had a very troubled life. Despite his income, he looked for love he had, you know, a, a live-in lover, a partner for 12 years, and yet it wasn't an easy relationship. You know, he had medical problems. He did not have an easy life at any point. And being gay automatically made his life hard for much of that life. Um, he was a dark figure and, and actually said himself that he suffered from depression. I think he probably suffered from clinical depression, in fact, it's sort of old fashioned clinical depression. And that's not, I think, widely, rec excuse me, widely recognized. Amanda, what are your thoughts on? Oh, well, I, I always find that, um, like I said at the beginning, I found his work disturbing from the very first time I, I've looked at it. Um, and maybe that's partly because the when I first really became aware of Warhol, I was clipping out his obituary. <laughs> but uh, there is something about it that disturbs me. And I don't think it would disturb me if that the darkness wasn't there. Um, and maybe that, maybe it's my darkness, um, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, and we'll just pack that away. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but there, I think there is something potent to Warhol. Um, and the idea of the surface and the idea of um, the guy painting portraits for hire and stuff like that, doesn't necessarily capture it. Um, you know, he was all of those things and additionally more. He was wrong-headed at every moment in the largest possible sense, I think. A great artist is not supposed to be painting society portraits. A great artist is not supposed to be gay. At every moment, he went à rebours, to use the title of the Hisman's book. He went against nature. He get, went against what he was supposed to be doing. And that's what I find both troubling and really exciting about him. And I think it's a it's prejudice that we still carry as art historians. If we think about an artist, for example, like John Singer Sargent, um, society portraitist par excellence, um, excellent painter, my God, an excellent painter, but reviled by many art historians, right? Not, not even worth discussing because he was a society portraitist at a moment when we don't have to be painting society anymore. Um, we don't have to have kings and queens as our patrons. And, you know, it's something that Warhol could fall into, and yet he doesn't. Well, I think, I mean, I have a particular read on the society portraits, which I think they're the most vicious portraits ever painted. Their superficiality is right there on the surface, showing the superficiality of those figures. Anyone who thinks they can read character and the greatness of those figures' souls in those portraits is just <laughs> wrong, I think. Should talk to Goya. Well, I think he's very <laughs> similar to Goya, and I'm not the first one to say that. Uh, that was already being said in the late six or in the early 70s about his society portraits. What else do we have? 
Thank you so much. So building on that question, our next uh, question will come from GE Schwartz and you should be able to ask your question now. Oh, thank you. And thank you for this wonderful day and this wonderful book. And I, I like the uh, shout out to Hoisman, sir, for a second ago. Um, with the early S and H green stamps canvas bearing the image of Jesus and the latter um, Raphael Madonna 699, was Warhol ever expressing his devotion in a way that came naturally as a pop artist? You know, I'm unusual in this. I think the devotion has been overstressed. I would say that Warhol was wildly devout for a left-wing homosexual avant-gardist artist of the 1960s. But remember, this is the 1960s and I don't remember what the number is. I think 90% of Americans went to church every Sunday. It's a very high number anyways. Uh, by the standards of the 1960s, Warhol was as bad a Catholic as you could possibly be. Sleeping regularly with other men was, did not qualify you as a good Catholic. And he wasn't a Catholic in the normal sense. He was not a Roman Catholic. He was a Byzantine Catholic. At the time it was called a Greek Catholic. And that was a totally different thing. So I think that the issue of his devotion is interesting, but it's very easy to overstate. I mean, he said on several occasions that um, he didn't believe in an afterlife. Well, that is the most basic necessity for being a Christian. Now, of course, he could have been lying. Um, you can never tell with Warhol, but there's no evidence of him being devout. There's evidence of him being way more devout than you'd expect for someone like him, which means that he went to church occasionally, you know, which is more devout than I am. And then probably most people in this, in this Zoom room are. Um, but it's a really interesting question. Uh, I don't think it bled into his art a whole lot because he was too good an avant-gardist to let that happen. I think even the Last Suppers, the late Last Suppers are not devout, but they're clearly interested in the issue of being devout. But you know, I think there's a case where if you repeat the Last Supper enough times, you're more likely to reduce its meaning than to increase it. But it's certainly a crazily interesting subject. Thank you. Yeah, he's making the Leo Steinberg argument about the Last Supper before Leo Steinberg makes it. Mm -hmm. Typical of Warhol. Typical. <laughs> Avant la lettre, at every turn. <laughs> Avant tous les lettres. <laughs> <laughs> Avant le alphabet. Uh, so our next question will come from the fabulous Johami Natalie Cardenas, who you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hello, thank you so much for allowing me to talk. And thank you so much for the exhibition. Um, I have a question it, it regarding the intention of Warhol. You were talking about uh, intentions of artists in general. And uh, I was interested because from the beginning of the of the slides, like the, the canned soups, I felt that feeling of where am I? Like my intimacy. And then there was that, that uh, you know, like Amanda made a comp comparison between uh, Rothko and, and, and Warhol. So my question is like, do you think Warhol had ever thought like be conscious really had, had a clear idea of what, you know, where the direction, uh, where, where his idea of audience were direct, where it was directed, had a, di a direction, uh, a clear di direction? That's a really nice question, I think, because normally the question is, was Warhol aware of any of this? Normally the question is about his intentionality as an artist in the making of the art. The question about his audience is way more interesting because I don't think most artists have a clear set of intentions and will never know them. You can never tell. But I do think that with Warhol, we do, I like to believe we know something about his audience and the audience he wanted. And my argument at least is that the audience he wanted was a high art audience, was the audience that went to museums. He was very hurt and said he was very hurt that MoMA owned almost nothing by him. MoMA kept slighting him. MoMA only, only owned things that they were given. Um, he really cared about, he pretended not to care about reviews, but he was hurt by bad reviews. He wanted to be, you know, he wanted to be up there with Rothko, with Joseph Alberts, with the most respected, serious avant-gardists of the 20th century. That's why I keep coming back to the notion that he was a modernist, much more than he was a postmodernist. He wanted to be part of the canon, I think, and of course he achieved it. So audience, I think we, I like to believe we do know about the, his preferred audience. The funny thing is that he realized that the best way to, to, to impress that audience was to pretend that you were going for a different audience. That is to pretend that you were just 
a part of pop culture that you were just speaking to the average Joe was the most interesting artistic gesture you could do. And that in the long run would get people like us in 2020 talking about, about his art. So I think his interest in pop culture was a little bit of fakery. I think it was a lot of it was about seeing the interest as an interesting performative act, put it that way. Thank you. Hope that made some sense. <laughs> Great. Uh, our next question will come. I feel like this is a lightning round, like we're quizzing you. Uh, <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> uh, our next question, or we're like all studying jump for the jump. <laughs> Our next question comes from the lovely Lynn Crawford, who usually has the best background. So we shall see. She was good yesterday. We'll see if she can match her level yesterday. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Um, I have a question about the work of Warhol and Truman Capote. I think I discovered them both about the same time. I think I read in Cold Blood about the same time I started seeing Warhol's paintings. And I had a sensation that I couldn't identify, but how it, I would articulate it now, and this might be really off, but I felt there was a really interesting deft blend of voyeurism and empathy. Mm -hmm. I felt, I, I never, I felt some some blend of that that I couldn't quite identify. And I'm curious what you think about that. That seems incredibly smart. Um, you might not know this, but you probably do. You know, Warhol's first ever solo show in a gallery, am I right? First ever, yes, pretty much first ever solo show in a gallery was of drawings for stories by Truman Capote. Ah. So he's already, and, and in 1948, when Truman Capote's book comes out, it's clear that Warhol knows it instantly and is deeply interested in it. Um, so Truman Capote is clearly a gay, uh, specifically a gay hero for Warhol. Um, I had never made the, the connection to In Cold Blood. And I'd be interested in thinking if someone who knows far more about uh, the history of queer culture than I do, could make a connection between uh, disaster, empathy, uh, death, as part of queer, a queer uh, and, culture. And criminals. And criminality. And people, you're yeah. interested in crime and criminals and that figure. I bet you that if you went back and I'm sure people have to the 1965, I think, yeah, it comes out in 65 in Cold Blood. I bet if you went back to some of the reviewing, there'd be either explicit or uh, implicit homophobic or even homophilic discussions of the, of the book, probably in the terms of camp. I bet you people talked about in Cold Blood, even in Cold Blood as being camp. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I haven't done the work myself. But I, there was an interest in the wrongness of caring about death and criminals as being the wrongness of camp. And that's a little bit there in Sontag already, which mm. he's writing about camp. By the way, it's worth pointing out, Warhol is often interpreted in terms of Sontag, Sontag's insights into camp. But I think it's almost certain that she got many of ideas about camp from Warhol, in fact. <laughs> that Warhol's there as the marker of camp and she realizes, oh, if I analyze Warhol, I've got camp in a sense. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so much that I've never thought about and now I'm like uh, swimming. Our next question comes from the fabulous Nick Bennett. Who Hi, is, is my mic on? Interrupted by politics? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we're good. Uh, well, thank you, Blake and Amanda for this amazing conversation. Um, I'm, I'm really hesitant to actually ask this question because it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, cliched speculation, but I figure, you know, it's Warhol, so why not? Um, I know that like in his later career, Warhol was, you know, playing around with computers and trying to do these sort of like digital renderings of paintings and whatnot. And my, my question really is in that speculation, if, if, if Warhol would have lived to the current moment, do you think that, because I know he was fighting towards the end of his life and career to kind of remain relevant, do you think he would have been able to maintain relevancy to the current moment? And I, I ask that specifically to you, Blake, because you know of all of this research you've done and, and, and in this biography, I'm really curious what your perspective is on that. You know, I can only answer that in the most general terms. 99.9% .9 of even the very, very greatest, most interesting artists do fade away in their later career. What's amazing is that 
up until his death in 87, after his death, his work did deteriorate, I have to admit that. But um, before he died, he was still making very good work up until the very end. So if ever there was an artist that you could imagine having a fabulous late career, it might be Warhol. And the only thing I would say is that he'd be making really, really interesting work like John Acumfra or, you know, I would just list my favorite artists and say, well, I guess he'd be making work like what I think is the best work made today, given that he seems to have had an incredibly lively mind. What I don't think he'd be doing, it's often said, well, he'd be on Instagram, you know, he'd be the king of the selfie. I think that's a misreading of him. It imagines that his engagement with popular culture had no depth to it. I think the fact that Instagram is so ubiquitous would have made him avoid it, possibly. He wanted to be a great fine artist who pretended to be a pop figure, I think. That's my reading at least. So I don't see him as engaging in sort of the superficiality of superficial uh, uh, net art. Um, but you know, this it's an unanswerable question. You're right. Um, I just think he probably would have been making awfully good art. <laughs> that's, that's about as good as I can get. What do you think, Amanda? I, I think um, as you were saying that I was thinking that he would be obsessed with the glitch uh -huh. And so the, the opportunity to make glitch art could be something that I think that Warhol would have been really, really interested in. I suspect too that he might have gone back to being more underground. Yeah, and you know, he might have realized that, and I hate to say this, that art is in a really parlous place right now. And he might have decided that art, he might have been a more of a relational aesthetician. I mean, he already was in his own day. He really, a lot of his art was about social practice. He might have pushed further in that direction because he would have been troubled, I think, by the extent to which the market has initiated so much art. Well, that's that's my take on it, at least. Um, so I think he might have been actually troubled by how much worse the art now is than it was in 1969. Um, he might have felt that way. But of course, I may just be absolutely ventriloquizing, putting my words into his mouth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Amanda, I'm so interested by this because I agree, I feel like glitch makes sense. But then I'm reminded as I was doing the Instagram promo, almost all of the uh, little like animated images that come up when you type in Andy Warhol are like soup cans and some variation of glitch. So I feel like, you know, what hasn't happened in reality, the internet has provided. Right. We've made our own Warhol, right? We were getting the Warhol we deserve and Douglas Crimps parlance. Yeah. Uh, our next question will come from Oriane Stender, who I will, uh, you can turn on your microphone now. Hi. Um, in considering Warhol's closeness or palling around with people like Nancy Reagan and other conservatives in, I guess it was the early 80s, mid 80s, I'm not sure exactly, but in his interview mag years, he seemed to really party with these types like Nancy Reagan. I mean, considering how conservative they were and, and completely uninterested in, and not um, compassionate towards the AIDS epidemic and, you know, the way Reagan totally dismissed and kind of mocked AIDS patients. What was, do you think he had a political affinity with them or was it just kind of his high society hobnobbing thing or what? Yeah, I do. Th I don't think he had a political affinity. I mean, there's tons of evidence in, in terms of sort of party politics there's t in his archive, his vast archive, there are tons and tons and tons of, and I've talked about this before, of thank you notes from left-wing causes saying, thanks for contributing a work, thanks for contributing money. So party politics wise, he was a, you know, not a left-wing Democrat. Uh, well, in those days, a middle of the road Democrat would be on the left wing of today's Dem Democratic Party, of course. So in th that sense, he was uh, Dem a Democrat, but, you know, he wasn't, he, he wasn't deeply engagé in every moment of his waking life. He was relatively passive politically. I don't think he, he uh, appreciated the politics of people like, like Reagan. I think you're right. It was part of his, uh, to use the word swanning about, or maybe that's my word, in, in high society. But I think he had a distance from them. I mean, when you read even the published diaries and certainly some of the unpublished diaries that I've had access to, there's just a few pages of them, um, they, it's clear that he has, he has real trouble with that world, even though he's in it. And the society portraits, I think, reveal that, that though he's making money uh, portraying these people, there's a, there's a 
a real edge to them as well. So I think he has a complicated relationship. I mean, after all, Goya was also palling around, swanning around with the idiot bourbon aristocrats, even as he was doing coruscatingly political work. Um, so the, that, that kind of tension is certainly there in Warhol. I'm not gonna pretend that he didn't pal around with those people. Those, if I had I been alive at the time, I would have said, what the hell are you doing? You know, the Shah of Iran was not a good person and Warhol knew it, should have known it and did know it. So no, there's definitely, he was not an angel. He was very far from being an angel. On the AIDS front, he was very afraid of AIDS and like many, many people and many gay people at the time, but he did, you know, he was the honor, I guess the honor and chairman of one AIDS fundraiser. He was, he was not uninvolved in some of the AIDS fundraising and AIDS issues. So he wasn't oblivious to it. He was just scared out of his mind. And I think that if you looked at uh, gay culture in the early eighties, you'd find other, you know, fine upstanding gay, gay citizens who were terrified and did stupid paranoid things to avoid getting AIDS. I mean, Warhol was worried that when he was kissed by a gay designer or someone he thought was gay, I guess it was Alvin Klein, if my memory serves, he was worried that the bristles in his beard might have pierced his skin when they kissed and that that would give Warhol AIDS. So he was really paranoid. But again, I think a lot of people were at that moment. It wasn't good, but I think it was pretty common. But I can't defend him completely. The Shah of Iran was, it was a creep. There's no doubt about it. And Warhol should have stayed a million miles from him. I mean, he, was, he wasn't a creep. He was a murderer, a horrible murderer to, and torturer. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm learning so much today. Uh, our next question. So I feel like in the early days of the internet, you could make an internet friend, like a cyber friend. Uh, that sounds dirty, but it's not. Introducing my internet friend, uh, Nicole Kirwan, who's tuning in from Ireland, uh, who's gotten on board with our talks despite the significant time difference. Uh, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi, how's it going? Um, yeah, I'm tuning in from Ireland um, and it's uh, half seven at night here. So um, it's been a nice evening talk for me, but um, I really, really enjoy this. Um, I just want to say a big thank you. Um, I'm delighted I've come across Brooklyn Rail, but um, I learned a lot about Andy Warhol when I was in school and um, what I suppose would be high school. We call it secondary school. And um, I never came across anything to do with his interview magazine days when I was learning a lot about him in, in education and stuff like that. And I was just kind of wondering if you guys had any thoughts that you guys wanted to share about his interview days, because I follow, I think there's like an interview mag um, Instagram and I follow that and I never really get a whole lot of information about it. And I never really see a whole lot about it. And people don't seem to talk that much about it. Um, so I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts on it at all. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, uh, Warhol often had very little involvement. Once Warhol, once interview stopped being a film journal, originally it was a film journal that was in its subtitle. Once it became the interview we know, he had very little hands-on uh, contact with the making of it. So a lot of the, all, really all the editorial decisions would be made by the people he hired. Uh, you know, he, he would have vetted it. Some people say that he didn't even look at it till after it was back from the printers when it was too late to change anything. A couple of little things, he often wanted to get an avant-garde artist onto the cover and his editors wouldn't allow him to do that. So that's kind of interesting that he wanted it to be a somewhat different magazine than it was. Uh, but I, for me, the uh, interview was essentially part of his business art practice. That it's basically a way to both make money and be part of popular culture in a very direct way, especially make money. Though it actually, I shouldn't even say that. It never made money, but it pretended to make money. And that for Warhol is more important than making money. A failed business is just as good a piece of business art, as successful a work of business art as a successful business is. And, inter and interview was almost always a failed business. Um, so I do think it has to do with being part of popular culture. And I see that Nedry McPhee uh, has a question about that that maybe we can get to. But it, I don't think it has that the actual contents, what's inside of interview matters anywhere near as much as the fact of being the owner of Interview Magazine, the part owner. He always had, or almost always had partners involved in it. Business art, I've written about it a bunch of times in the New York Times and other places, uh, art news, I guess. I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of Warhol that's most problematic and complex. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very intrigued by the failed business 
as being like almost as successful as a piece of business art as the successful business. I feel like that's uh, music for trying times. Um, our next question will come from Amelia Saul and Alexander Nagel. I refuse uh, to take questions from them. Next question. <laughs> Absolutely refuse to take that. I just end Zoom. Yeah. I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> All right. Little insider jokes there. Good friends of mine. Hi, Blake. This is hey, this there. is wonderful to hear. Um, I it's amazing and interesting to hear you talk about Andy Warhol. Um, <laughs> you've heard that, me a hundred times before. But. Yes, and it's been wonderful. Um, you've you've done such a profound deep dive over many years. Like it's a it's a it's a real work of many years and like profound insight and a lot of work and a lot of viewing. So what's missing from the book? That's a really good question. Nothing. No, uh, I'm almost done with it. I swear <laughs> I'm getting to the end, almost there. Uh, that's a really good question. You know, I would have liked to have, I don't think the late years really get, I mean, you know, the early years, and this is normal with biography, it's always this way. The given that there's an assumption of causality that the early years in some ways cause the later years, you concentrate on the formation of the artist, use the French term, uh, in order to see what they become. So the late years do tend to be slighted. And there's a tendency, which I'm guilty of too, as seeing the career as necessarily having ended in 1987. That is, things were coming to an end, but they weren't. He was only in his 50s. They could have continued. So it's a mistake to think, oh, it's petering out. It's coming to an end. He's about to die. And I think I did make that mistake. I think the later years could have been dug into more deeply. Uh, I kind of wish I did. I don't think, although I enjoyed writing about Studio 54 uh, as a kind of phenomenon, as a, you know, I did a bit of social history there. I think the real meaning of those years and the meaning of that particular aspect of gay culture, I think I could have gotten more deeply into. Um, and, and maybe following, oh, sorry, following on that because you're talking about of uh, Studio 54, were there any secrets that you found out that you chose to let him keep? No, <laughs> I don't think that's a job of a biographer. Wow. I, I revealed some relatively nasty things about him, I think, um, mm -hmm. because he was flawed. I mean, you know, the fact that he really, he grabbed at a lot of young men's dicks, you know, if he was in a limousine with a 16 year old, his hands would be all over the place. That's no longer considered acceptable. I do think it was absolutely par for the course in early 80s culture or late 70s culture, but it was, you know, that that's not something that can be excused. Um, but I reveal that in the book. So um, I try, as I say, not to apportion praise and blame because I just can't get that Victorian, but the blame is there on the pages of the book, I, I think. Mm -hmm. you know? um, one of the things that Blake does often is quotes people as saying how stinky um, <laughs> Warhol was. So I guess that's a question, smelly, not smelly. And both, you get people saying both things. I mean, one of the things I would like to just mention briefly is that so many of the people I talked about reject absolutely the Drella image of Warhol. They say so many people who st are still alive said, no, he was generous, he was sweet. He was a really nice avuncular figure, especially to younger people, younger women, especially. The number of people who think that he was not saintly, but actually a really good person outnumber the few people who've had a lot of attention for uh, their attacks on Warhol, saying that he was a monster. They really, the, the people who think he was closer to a saint outnumber the, the people who think he was a monster. And the evidence for him being a monster is really complicated and interesting, um, but a lot of it is performative and a lot of it has to do with how we receive particular acts of his. It's much, the generosity is straightforward. You can see it right there in the record. The monstrosity is much more complicated and frankly more interesting, which is one reason we tend to dwell on it. No follow-up question? <laughs> I don't what did you think was missing? There, I'll throw this out to everyone. What did people, though the three of you have actually read the book cover to cover, which doesn't include Alex Nagel, as I just found out. <laughs> Um, I've read several of his books several times. I'll just point that out, but there you go. Um, <laughs> what do people think was missing? I'm, I'd be really interested in the chat or out loud or whatever, what, what, what seemed to be lacunae in the book. Amanda, be honest, I can take it. Well, I, I really wanted more pictures. I, I, I mean, this is an art historian speaking, right? But 
I, I really, really wanted more illustrations. Now, granted, I was reading the ebook version um, because it is so big that I, I knew I couldn't read it um, in, the, in the print copy. Um, I like to lie down when I read, so I knew that was not going to be a possibility. And so perhaps the ebook version has fewer images, but I really would have liked more images from his life. Um, you know, that there were there were photographs that you described of him, and I would have liked to have seen those. And so that would be the one thing that I would say was missing. I totally agree with you. Unfortunately, because we wanted it to sell to his, you know, to a mass audience, it's written hopefully for a mass audience. We wanted it available to have more images would have sent the price through the roof. Yeah. I didn't want it to be a hundred dollar book. I didn't want it to have, you know, the kind of audience that an academic press would have. I hoped it would have a bigger audience. And that was just a sheer financial consideration. I mean, to just to bind a book this thick costs an unbelievable amount. Mm -hmm. um, so it just was purely economic. And frankly, I thought, A, people have some, a lot of those images in their mind. And in a millisecond, you can Google up almost every image that I mentioned. I mean, it really, you found the Campbell's soup, the camp foot um, on the internet, which I didn't know one could. So uh, I assume that people are such Googlers that they'd read my book having this in one very strong hand and you know, their cell phone <laughs> in the other hand. I'm not that strong. <laughs> Uh, I also want to point out the brilliant Claire Henry, brilliant because you said so and that's become clear in the chat, uh, says what's missing is also whatever is on all those unpreserved audio tapes at the AWM. I'm dying to know. AWM being the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. Everyone is dying to know. What's there up? There are 3,000, 4,000 tapes that for legal reasons that aren't absolutely transparent can't be, they can be listened to by scholars, but you're not allowed to take notes you're not allowed quoting from them. So I have listened to several dozen, I guess, um, that have been digitized. Most of them haven't been digitized yet. Um, if I suddenly came into, I was gonna say $10 million, but let's say $100 million just for the hell of it. I would give a big chunk of it to the museum and say, uh, you know, digitize all of these, get transcripts of all of them. And at least then I think in 2037 is when their plan is to release them. Uh, again, for legal reasons, then they'll, they'll be ready to be released, but it is, that is the great question. Now I've listened to, as I say, I don't know, 15, 20, something like that. And mostly they're him gossiping with friends. I mean, there's only a few nuggets. There are some great nuggets, but they're nuggets. They're really small nuggets. There's one of my favorite nuggets is when he was thinking of doing the illustrations to Little Prince. Um, there's a bunch of stuff like that that's really great. But, you know, Warhol talked and, you know, to five different people every night and recorded those conversations. So a lot of it is just the worst gossip you've ever heard in your life. And he was very good, as I'm not, at just saying, oh, tell me more, you know, how big was his dick? Did he have a really big dick? So you get a lot of that on the, on the tapes that I've listened to at least. And Warhol had a tape recorder with him. As soon as like he could have a tape recorder with him, he had a tape recorder with him. And it was with him so ubiquitously that he called it his wife. Um, so there too, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? That these tapes then are, are again, banal and every day and perhaps the things that you might talk about, uh, you know, with your wife or, or, or not, you know, the, the, the big dick thing, perhaps no, but um, you never know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's a nice little, just a tiny little micro factoid there. You know, ever the, he did refer to her in interviews, her, <laughs> did refer to his, uh, tape recorder as, as his wife, Sony. But in fact, the first tape recorder wasn't a Sony. It was actually an Uher, a fancy German, big reel-to-reel -reel machine. So these things, these little nuggets, oh, his wife, Sony, that was the name of his, of his uh, tape recorder. Well, he doesn't get a Sony till quite a bit later. So these little facts from later in his life drift back into the early history, what we imagine to be the early history of Warhol. And it's one of the problems. People are always imagining that the sort of classic silly Warhol with the silver wigs and the leather jacket from 65 is the Warhol of the 50s or of the early 60s or of when he was making the Campbell soups and it's not. That classic iconic Warhol is really limited in time but it's sort of, he, it spreads, that image spreads to his whole career. Wonderful. That's incredible. Uh, I think after global pandemic, we should all make a collective excursion to the Andy Warhol Museum and like batter at the doors and come with our recording equipment and our laptops um, and our transcription pedals and 
all of our staff will just <laughs> occupy. It's a great um, thing, by the way. It's worth a visit even without that goal. <laughs> even without militant takeover? <laughs> if you say so. Um, our final remarks will come from our publisher and the fine captain of this ship, Fong H. Bui. And Fong, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Malvika. You're making this whole episode so fun. Distracted me from my <laughs> editorial for the November issue. But Blake, thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. It's so fun, so lively. I must say that I remember once talking to John Updike after his review of Warhol, the MoMA retrospective in 1989, I think. It was at um, Bob Silver's home, you know? And I said to him, uh, I'm not so sure I, I really uh, think you think of how you thought of Warhol calling your review fast art for busy people. Is that accurate? Because you kind of left out his film. Maybe everything else is fast, but film the opposite. It's a slowness of film. Yeah. Some of them, you know, last for hours and hours, you know, like Sleep, the one with John Jono, our late friend. But it's just the, the complexity, as you mentioned, Blake, you know, the, you can't really reduce great art to a certain neat category or reading whatsoever. He alludes to all of it. But I'm interested in the, the whole notion of suffering because I remember um, reading Victor Frankl, who said if, if there's meaningful, any meaning in life at all, there must be meaning in suffering. I think suffering for Warhol is identical to the way that we read or thought of, you know, Walt Whitman. You know, it's a very uh, imminent democracy. It's very vast. And I really feel that's how we think of Warhol in, in that regard, you know, in, in every single aspect of it. Because when you were mentioned about the factory, you know, I, I thought of also how Jonas Makers were able to create his own in the East Village for the Advanga cinema. In fact, you can argue the opposite. Maybe Warhol was aspired to create a similar community through Jonas. I think that's factually correct. Yeah, and it's very, it's very interesting how he, I think the appetite, the, the aptitude for ambition, that democratic vista is the one why we kept being so incredibly, you know, perpetually impressed and moved by the work. Uh, and I was thinking this also because, you know, we've been dealing with the whole crisis of Augustine now show in, in, um, in that four museum, the DC National Gallery, the one in Houston and the Tate, was it the Tate? Yes. Uh, and the one being, the other one being in Boston, exactly. And how they um, wanted to make that reduction so readable and frightened by the complexity that you have just now spoken of Warhol. And similarly, you know, I, I remember, um, I, remember moderating the panel um, on Gustin during the Nixon drawing show. That must have been three years ago, four years ago. Uh, yeah. And Gustin, you know, you know, basically portray of the Klansman is exactly what we've been talking about Warhol, the way you describe, you know, the dark, the darkness that Amanda seemed to be uh, very um, sensitive to. And I am at times, we all are. You know, but the thing about um, Gustin too, in reference to Warhol, um, I remember Lisa Suskevich on the panel trying to describe how, how in in uh, Sona Nissin's, you know, in the in the Gulag Archipelago book, where he say, if only there were evil people somewhere, insidiously committed evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? And I think that's why every time you see Warhol, you are reminded of all that multitude of complexity. Even, even the sim simplest photograph, 
um, you know, object he made is, I don't mean the major work that we've been looking through right now, you know, but I have one question for you, finally. Um, what do you think of his relationship? Because I heard that Lynn Crawford mentioned about her uh, exposure to Truman Capote and work at the same time. So I'm thinking about Alexander Yolas, you know, Blake? Of course. Who's also was a homosexual, who was a um, very prominent figure, created that landmark gallery called Ugo Gallery. That must have been in the mid 40s, I think, where Warhol had his first show. You mentioned that, okay. 1952. So the drawings was, was. Exactly. Yeah. So, what was the relationship there? Because I'm interested in surrealism, because they were all surrealists. Um, Yolas was known for have, having built the surrealist collection for Dominique de Manille and many others. And through him, there was also a group of people especially View Magazine also. That's also, to me, that's interesting, that whole community uptown. But Warhol was downtown and he was so young. So I just wondering what was that community like? Had it have any significant influence early on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Warhol knew the editors of View. They were important to him as senior gay figures. Um, he was very interested in the, in the artist Paul uh, Chelichev. He owned a very interesting gay themed Ch Chelichev, who's a figure that we've pretty much completely lost track of now. But that whole, all those artists associated with Iolas's Hugo Gallery were an avant-garde that, that, that we really don't take seriously now, but was very important to Warhol. And I think getting his first solo show at the Hugo Gallery, even though it was only upstairs in a space yeah. that was really part of the bookstore. I mean, he didn't really get a Hugo Gallery show, but the headlines for previous Hugo Gallery shows were, you know, uh, gallery shows impossibly ridiculous art. I mean, it was, it stood for the avant-garde. So I think that was incredibly important to Warhol. He knew that world and it was a gay avant-garde, right? Yeah. It was the avant-garde, but it was explicitly populated by, by a gay community. And then of course, Iolas gives him his last show too, obviously purely by accident, because no one knew it was gonna be his last show. But those last suppers in Milan were uh, arranged by, by Iolas, who is dying of AIDS when Warhol goes to Milan and dies shortly, shortly thereafter, as Warhol does too. So it's really, the relationship is really, it's kind of uh, too good to be true. If you put it into a movie, no one would believe you that he'd have his first and last show from this great gay avant-gardist. Um, it's yeah. a very interesting. And Yolas is the greatest storyteller ever. So he tells stories about Warhol that I think are, have absolutely no relationship to reality, but there's some really, really <laughs> good stories. I've got to ask you a question though. Did you put on that shirt in Warhol's honor or? I wondered that too. <laughs> yeah, why not? Good, good. There's a bunch of pages in my book just about the meaning of that shirt when Warhol adopted it in 1965. So yeah. I'm very keen on the Breton shirt. So what the, is the meaning of the shirt? Um, for, for Fong or for me or for Warhol? For Warhol. Both. It has all sorts of different, it floats around. It has this amazing, it's like an amazing nexus of meanings. I mean, Jean Seberg is wearing it in, um, in right. Breathless and Abu Souffle. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also worn, uh, I'm so bad at names, in uh, uh, the movie about the wild, uh, about the motorcycle gang with Marlon Brando. Um, someone help me here. Uh, the Wild Bunch? The is Wild one. Bunch, yeah. yeah. So it's got all these different meanings. It has a place in gay culture. It's really, it's like we're all sunglasses. These, these objects that he chose to, to be iconic of his persona actually are not straightforward and simple at all. They have this incredibly rich semiotic field that they live in. Okay, one, one last question. What was the relationship to the tail end where he collaborated with Francesco Clemente and, and Jean, you know, um, Jean, Jean, Jean Basquiat? Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, yeah. I think it's classic Warhol. I'll put my cards on the table. I don't think that the neo-expressionism of the 80s was a successful artistic movement. So I think there's a lot of bad art. But Warhol always, this is sort of the, the downside of Warhol's avant-gardism, classic avant-gardism, is that he wanted to be on the cutting edge where it were, regardless of where it was. And he, his diaries are great on this. I mean, he clearly thinks, oh, I've got to get back to painting. How am I going to do this? These youngsters are making art. But he says quite explicitly, 
boy, they're making really terrible art, but that's sort of what you're supposed to be making now. But in his own art, I think he addresses that problem, the problem of the meaning of painting, the death of painting. Um, that's all there in, in the work he's making at that same, same period. So I think he, he does them one better. I hope that Francesco is not listening to me. <laughs> I, I think Francesco knows my views, uh, I'm afraid. So, uh, I, well, thank I, you, Blake. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Amanda. Back thank you, you th thank, thanks to everyone who attended. This has been really fun. Thank you so much to the two of you, but we're not done. Uh, we've uh, now reached poetry hour, so we have a tradition at the rail. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we used to sit around and read poems to one another at lunchtime. And now we've upgraded, we've gotten professional poets uh, to join us. So today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet Sharon Mesmer to the stage. Uh, Sharon Mesmer's most recent poetry collection, Greetings from My Girly Place, was one of Entropy's best of 2015. Her other collections are Annoying Diabetic Bitch, The Virgin Formica, and Half Angel Half Lunch. She's the co-editor of Flarf, an anthology of Flarf, and has published three collections of short fiction, including Mavi Ayanago. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, the Paris Review, American Poetry Review, and the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, she lives in Brooklyn and teaches literature and creative writing at NYU in the New School. But before that, she was from the south side of Chicago, where I'm located currently. Um, so everyone give it up for our fabulous poet, Sharon Mesmer. I just changed my shirt. <laughs> I had a green shirt on before, but this is my Jean Seberg shirt and I was really influenced by her. So I thought I would wear it. Um, that was a fabulous program. Thank you, Blake. That was just so wonderful. And Fong, thank you again. Um, I have a little poem that I think, you know, might fit. It's called, um, Our Celebrities, Our Celebrity Cheese. The more corrupt our country gets, the more we love our celebrities. Their jobs, their haircuts, their money. One year is as another, and it becomes hard to remember even the death of one's own mother when Nicole Kidman's Botox issues stand firmly in the way. Let's face it. We hate our fat people, but we love our celebrities. Posh Spice's love life is more on our daughter's minds than dolls are. And every damn day, Brangelina dies a little for our sins. I have to say, I wrote this poem a long time ago. So some of the celebrities are not with us anymore. And certainly Brangelina is over. Yea, though I be surrounded by despair, I shall not let it engulf me, for you shall take my sufferings from me, George Clooney, with your gentle hands. The darkest and harshest of life's events are simply mysteries of gentle benevolence. Hasn't Christina Aguilera ministered to this? When our celebrities heard that England was at the bottom of the European Tree League, they sprung into action with 5,000 pounds of nutrient-rich goo sealed in lard and swirling with bacteria. That's how celebrity cheese was created. Celebrity cheese has become the most important of all celebrity cheeses in the post-Diana celebrity cheese-making genre. Celebrity cheese is milk's leap toward immortality, and somewhere in the world today lives a celebrity cheese child who will change everything. Our celebrities are regularly asked, do you make and eat your own cheese? Whitney Houston, for example, packages and finishes her own cheese logs, and Robin Gibb wants Bulgarian sheep milk cheese in his dressing room on the day of every concert. What cheeses would you like to see in celebrity cheese? What cheeses would you like to see in celebrity cheese deathmatch? Today I got calls from David Bowie, Melanie Griffith, and celebrity cheese. Whose do you think I answered first? With their basic human themes, our celebrities are one of the most powerful and personal ways of working out what we feel about celebrity and cheese. So let's cozy up in celebrity style, in love with every living being in the universe. Let's take a good look at Alec Baldwin's natal chart to better understand why he would mouth off at his kid. Yes, there is a lot wrong with this picture. 
But I think you'll understand that if I suddenly slip into my dirty ballerina flats and stained sweater, it's only because I love Jennifer Garner. I love her and Victor Garber. I love her and Ben Affleck together. What is my message? That we are living in the great celebrity days. So let's hold ourselves to that power that gathers on the celebrity side of transcendence. Let's drink our fill of love till morning. Let's gorge ourselves on terrible, perfect apples. And let's accessorize because the ability to accessorize is what separates us from non-celebrities and cheese. That's it. <laughs> Oh, thanks for putting that in the chat about the hyperallergic thing. Oh yeah, it's, that's like the best title I've ever heard. She makes the dirty work look like a diga. Uh, Sharon Mesmer, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you as well to Blake. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Fong. And thank you to everyone who was here with us today. Please join us again on Monday for a conversation between visual artist Fred Tomaselli. Um, and curator and rail editor at large, Toby Camps, which will conclude with a poetry reading from Dow Strom. That will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Um, other than that, uh, you can now, let's see. Oh, oh I'll say one thing. Go ahead. Is, if anyone wants to continue, we didn't get to all the questions. I'm totally happy to chat on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, what's that other one called, Twitter? So I'm, I'm available to answer questions or to receive criticism, whatever, on, on any of those things. I'm totally happy. Amazing. Little Blake Kopnik. Uh, you can now all turn on your microphones if you'd like and uh, take Blake up on that offer. And beyond that, uh, I hope you all have a beautiful weekend and a restful few days. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Blake so and Amanda. Thank this you. Was great. Thanks, Thanks so Sharon. Much, Blake and Amanda. Thank you. Sharon. Sharon. Amazing. Stuck around. Thank you, Sarah, for a beautiful Thank you, Fong. Thank, 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you.